ليس الغريب هو الذي فارق الديار وودع الأهل ولكن الغريب هو الذي يجد والناس من حوله يلعبون ويصحو والناس من حوله ينامون ويسلك درب الخير والناس في ضلالهم يتخبطون وصدق الشاعر إذ يقول قال لي صاحب أراك غريبا بين هذا الأنام دون خليلي قلت كلا بل الأنام غريب أنا في عالمي وهذه سبيلي هذا هو الغريب غريب عند العابثين من البشر ولكنه عند ربه في مقام كريم غرباء 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 نحن جند الله دوما دربنا درب الأباة إن تسل عنا فإنا لا نبالي بالطغاة نحن جند الله دوما دربنا درب الأباة غرباء غرباء سنمضي للخلود لن نبالي بالقيود بل سنمضي للخلود فلنجاهد ونناضل ونقاتل من جديد غرباء هكذا الأحرار في دنيا العبيد فلنجاهد ونناضل ونقاتل من جديد غرباء هكذا الأحرار في دنيا العبيد غرباء 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 كنا سعداء بكتاب الله نتلوه صباحا ومساء كم تذاكرنا زمانا يوم كنا سعداء بكتاب الله نتلوه صباحا ومساء نحن جند الله دوما دربنا درب الأباة إن تسل عنا فإنا لا نبالي بالطغاة 
نحن جند الله دوما دربنا درب الأباء غربا 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 قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم بدأ الإسلام غريبا وسيعود غريبا كما بدأ فطوبى للغرباء غربا غربا بجن شاء الله بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله رب العالمين وبه نستعين على أمور الدنيا والدين الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد ladies and gentlemen my brothers and my sisters we begin as per usual we praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for each and every blessing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has bestowed upon us. And hopefully by being thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will increase His favours upon us insha'Allah. We also begin this gathering by asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to send prayers and blessings and salutations to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless the family of the Prophet the companions of the Prophet, the Tabi'een, the Atba'i Tabi'een, and to whomsoever that follows in the footsteps of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam until the end of time. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah bless this gathering. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He increases us in knowledge. And hopefully with increase in knowledge, to increase in humility and humbleness. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah provides care to those amongst us who are unwell and our family members, and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provides ease and facilitation to those who are facing hardships and tribulations in life. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah provides patience and perseverance and victory to our brothers and sisters in Palestine. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah forgives us all inshallah, our family members, especially our parents, our loved ones, and the rest of the Muslimin and Muslimat. Ameen Rabbil Alameen. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, good morning and how is everybody doing? Sihat semua? Alhamdulillah, welcome back ladies and gentlemen to our CWG class, our normal Sunday morning tafsir class. Uh, we again begin by asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that whatever that we learn for today insha'Allah shall be of benefit. So this is the 31st of December, the very last day of the year. It's a long weekend, it's raining. There are some here nonetheless, walhamdulillah. And there's a lot uh, of our friends as well online. So again, uh, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless this gathering. Ameen ya rabbal alameen. Uh, apologies as well. Class was supposed to actually start or commence last week. But uh, I, I lost my voice from my trip to Umrah. Uh, and now I can't say that I have fully recovered. Still a bit coarse. But I'll try my very best inshallah. And I'm also thinking about the other class that we're doing at 2. And hopefully that you know, I can sustain until the end of the day and I, and I don't turn into Awi or some rocker at, at the end of it. Hopefully this will be okay, inshallah. Uh, today, inshallah, we are doing CWG and for the coming eight weeks, inshallah, we are going to be discussing the topic of Ulul Azmi. Uh, the, five, the five great prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah mentions in the Quran. Uh, and particularly to look at the perspective of determination and will and patience and perseverance. And this shall be the focus of our study, insha'Allah. Uh, but before we begin, welcome everybody, mashallah. Uh, before we begin, just as a quick reflection for my past trip. So, so I guess when, when I returned uh, back to Singapore, exactly a week, a bit after a week, uh, people have been like messaging me and asking me how I was and asking me concerning my trip and how it was. And, and, and in all honesty, I've not had time to truly process it. I, I, I've not. And, and in my awkwardness in dealing with those questions, at times I would answer by saying, Alhamdulillah, you know what, Kaaba is still square. Uh, and and Sa'i is still between Safa and Marwa. Alhamdulillah, just, you know what, out of awkwardness. But in all honesty, it, it was something that was truly, if there's a word to use, is the word surreal. It was. And again, uh, as, as a lot of you know, it is not unfamiliar for me, Umrah, in all honesty, right? I, I'm brought up by parents who professionally worked as mutawif throughout their entire life, for 30 years, in all honesty, right? So if you would ask my father, for example, like, how many times have you performed hajj? Hajj. He would say, I think 11. That's what he would say. 
And if you would ask him, how many times have you performed Umrah? He would say, I don't know. That's his answer. And when I was young, me, my brother, the whole family, whenever that my parents would go for Umrah, we would follow suit. So I'm not sure, right? So if you ask my brother or my sister, they've done Hajj and Umrah multiple times. I'm, I'm a bit lesser in regards to the count. But it's a lot. But this time around, it was different. It was familiar but unfamiliar at the same time, I, I would say. And if I have a particular reflection that I can provide and share, hopefully this is of benefit, I think that being in, in Mecca and Medina, the word that we can in fact use, welcome myself, uh, is that being in Mecca and Medina is truly a microcosm of religious life. And what I mean by that would be that when you adopt a life of religiosity, when you become a true Muslim and live like a Muslim, the thing that you are thinking about will be none other than akhirah and then part of worldly activity, right? And this is manifested well in the dua that we always read, Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana tawakina adhaban nabiya Allah. Allow for us great things in this world. Allow for us great things in the hereafter. These are the two things that we are always thinking about and striving towards, right? And in Mecca and Medina, when you think about the activities that you undergo and you do, it's that. You do nothing but worship Allah. You do nothing but go to prayer. You do nothing but do your tawaf. You do nothing but go to these historical sites and try to learn things about Allah, about the prophets, about Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallama. And the dunya part comes as well, right? You go to a bit of shopping and you buy abaya, not me. You buy your jubba and then you go to cafes like Mado and Moment. Anybody knows Mado and Moment? No? You go to these kind of places, right? And, and again, still, it is still rather lingering, the thought of being in Mecca and Medina. I still find myself each and every night, in all honesty, right? Since the night that I arrived in Singapore, I'm still on YouTube, like looking at the gates of Masjid Haram. Like I would tell my wife, hey, this gate is quite empty, as if we are going to go through that gate in a bit of time. And we're looking at the live feed in Medina as well, and it's raining. I was there in Mecca and it rained for four nights straight. Four nights straight. Back then, five years ago or ten years ago, if Mecca would have rained twice a year, that would have been plentiful. I was there in Mecca and it rained for four nights straight. In Medina, it was ten degrees. It was very different. Well, it was a beautiful experience. Not only that there is this dunya, akhirah kind of an experience that is very much balanced, you also have the two relationships that you are supposed to establish well. Your relationship with Allah and your relationship with fellow people. And the one with people is rather interesting. I'm not sure how many people are there in Mecca, how many people are there in Medina, but the answer is it's a lot. And with a lot of people, you have a lot of different character, different demeanors, some pleasant, some not as pleasant maybe, but in all that is good, inshallah. But as I'm trying to process and reflect upon my journey, I remember three people throughout the entire journey. And they were all drivers of many people, right? So for, for you guys who, who didn't know, I went for Umrah DIY. Meaning we went on our own selves, everything free and easy. So if you are doing it DIY, you need some form of driver to help you about, right? So in Mecca, we had a driver and he was Meccan, local, born and bred. And his name was Mish'al. And there was one thing that I, when I went to Umrah, I didn't want to do. I didn't want to speak Arabic. I'm not sure why. Because I'm quite a socially awkward person and I don't, I need to prepare for conversation. I'm not that type of a person that I meet you and immediately I can go on and on with conversation. So I, I didn't want to speak Arabic. And my father would always say that if you go to a particular place or a museum or whatever it is, right? Taufik, negotiate. Taufik, speak. Taufik, ask. And I'm like, mm, no, I don't want to. And what's also interesting would be when you go shopping in Mecca and Medina, for example, right? And this is something of convenience, I would say. A lot of the shopkeepers, whether they are locals, Arabs, or not locals, they speak Malay. So they would shout at you, Mari, Mari, Murah, Murah. And I'm, I was like, oh. And I would like joke around for a bit. I say, Tana, Tana, Murah, Murah, nak yang mahal. And they would like, and then they would say, oh, mahal pun ada. And I would say, mahal ada discount tak? 
Dia cakap ada. And I will say tapi jadi murah. So tak nak. And they will like. <laughs> Once we went to a particular shop and they started to converse in English. In English, right? So we spoke in English and I wanted a particular item with a particular detail. And conversation started to become difficult. And then being forced to kind of settle that particular issue, I then spoke in Arabic. And then the guy got angry. Like, you can speak Arabic. Why did you speak Arabic from the very beginning? I'm like, why well, you spoke to me in English? So Mishael, our driver, right? We rode around in his GMC. And I've never rode in a GMC before. Huge SUV. And he was very proud of his GMC. It was a 2023 model with some smart features. When he went to the highway, he would simply just press some buttons and then let his hand off the steering. I'm like, ooh. He would self-park and stuff, those kind of things, right? Whenever that we were on the journey and he would see another GMC, I would say, ooh, another GMC. He said, no, how's the Qadim? This is an old GMC. Mine is new. I'm like, ooh. Okay. okay. But again, from the very beginning, I didn't speak at all in Arabic to him. And then throughout the journey, the long journey, we went up to Ta'if and so on and so forth, right? And then I accidentally spoke in Arabic. And then quickly, not only that he was excited, he was able to identify my accent. And then he looked at me and said, Oh, you studied in Egypt, didn't you? I'm like, ayo. And then he got angry. He said, why didn't you apply for study in Mecca or Medina? I'm like, ah, this is what I did one, right? Lengthy conversations. Why didn't you study in Mecca and Medina? I said, please, I applied for years. I tried multiple times. The thing about Mecca and Medina, the merits of studying in Mecca and Medina, my brother studied in Medina, by the way. The merit of studying in Mecca and Medina would be, number one, if you're in Mecca, you're near Masjid Al-Haram. If you study in Medina, you're near Masjid Al-Nabawi, you're in sacred land. On top of that, there's not a single cent that you need to pay. However rich you are, you cannot pay to enroll in Mecca and Medina. They choose. So it's like going to Hogwarts, no? They choose. I applied for years. There was no reply. I was rejected. My brother applied for six months and he was accepted. I'm like, where is this unfairness coming from? And on top of that, there is a monthly stipend that the university provides to students. Accommodation, food, money. I applied. I wasn't accepted. And then he was like, it's okay, you try again. I said, I tried many times. He said, now you try again. Maybe you do your master's or your PhD. I have a wife and a kid. I'm working, I can't do that. And then he started to tell his story. So he is Meccan, born and bred. A family of business people. And he himself traveled all over the world. By the end of it, he said, but you know what? No place in the world feels like Mecca. So I'd rather stay in Mecca. The feeling that you have being in Mecca, and I'm sure that you feel this as well, and do not lie, he told me. There's a sense of calmness and serenity and peace that you feel. Despite the chaos of Mecca that you see, the feeling you will never get anywhere else in the world. I said, yeah. Now we went to Medina and we had another driver, but this time around not a GMC. This time we rode around in a huge Ford SUV. And interestingly enough, the driver was not local, the driver was Malaysian from Pontian Johor. Very interesting. And he has stayed in Medina for around four years. And the reason that he stays in Medina is simply because the wife is a nurse at a public hospital in Medina. She was selected somehow. And we went on talking about many things. And then I asked him, like, when was the last time that you went back to Johor? When was the last time that you went back to Pontian? And he said, oh, a couple of months ago. So he arrived a bit before COVID. COVID happened. He didn't want to go back. After COVID, he went back to Malaysia for a bit. And I asked him, like, what is it that you miss most about Malaysia, about Johor, about Pontian? And he said, Lau Lemak. And then he went on a long rant talking about Lau Lemak. In Medina, in Mecca, currently, there's a lot of Malaysian Indonesian restaurants. A lot. At the foot of Jabal Nur, there is now Bakso Unta. I'm not sure who would buy it, but they sell it. Right, Jabal Nur is now totally different. There's a new entrance to it. I was talking to a madam that's now concerning this particular issue, right? And then I asked him, like, when you went back to Johor and then you had your laut lemak for a long time, you didn't have it, like, how was it? And he said, nah, it wasn't worth it. He said, I would risk everything in Doha. I would risk and sacrifice my laut lemak 
to be here in Medina. And I'm thinking about these people like Mecca, Medina means so much to them. And I'm still going through Umrah, right? And the busyness and the hecticness has not allowed for me to settle and think about my own journey. Now, on my way back from Medina to the train station, we also had a driver, and he was Medinan, born and bred. And his name, and I remember distinctively, is Abdul Rahman al Ruhaili, because he gave me a name card at the end of it. Again, I didn't speak in Arabic, I spoke to him in English. And halfway through, somehow, it blurted out Arabic, and he started to look at me and say, Oh, you speak Arabic. And then he remarked again, Did you study in Egypt? <laughs> he identified my accent as well. And then he said, Yes. And then he went on a long rant again, but well, why didn't you apply to Makkah and Medina? Lagi sekali kena marah. And he said, whatever that I said earlier on. But he was different. He said, and this is what I realized later on, the Ruhaili family, which he comes from, the Rahman Ruhaili, comes from actually a very famous family in Medina. There is currently an important, a great scholar in Medina by the name of Sheikh Sulaiman Ruhaili. So he comes from that particular family, a family of business and a family of knowledge. And when he spoke, he spoke with a bit more distinction. He spoke with a bit more charisma, this particular gentleman. And then I asked him, like, have you always been in Medina? He said, yes, well, in fact, I've never traveled outside of Medina. The only place that I've ever went to is Mecca. Even for my honeymoon, when I got married 30 years ago, he said, our honeymoon was Mecca. I'm like, whoa. Not Bali, not the Maldives, no, Mecca. And then I remarked a bit casually, I said, oh, that's like Imam Malik, rahmatullah alayhi. If you guys remember, right, when we were studying pertaining to the four Imams of Madhab, that particular time, and even the rest of the scholars as well, traveling was important. The more that you traveled, it increased your credibility. The more that you traveled, your CV thickened, right? But Al-Imam Malik Rahmatullah Ali, the great Imam of Medina, never traveled anywhere except for Mecca. Because he believed that whatever that was in Medina was sufficient. The people who were in Medina who were great scholars that is enough for me, so he didn't travel. So I told him, oh, you're like Imam Malik Rahmatullah Ali. And he kind of brushed it off. Nobility, right? Humbleness. And then suddenly he casually slipped something, which kind of made me like, whoa. He said, I didn't want to travel because you know what? I was afraid. If I would travel, I would go outside of Medina and I would die outside of Medina. I'm afraid if I would not die in Medina. We were discussing this particular issue back then, pertaining to death. Our scholars mentioned that the Prophet Wasallam prohibited us asking for death. Once you not ask for death. Except for in two situations, specific situations. But it requires a bit of detailing. There's a particular narration in which the Prophet Sallallahu suggested that if a person is to ask for death, it is only within these particular circumstances. He says, it is to ask Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala in this way. Ya Allah, if you think that life is good for me, then extend me in my life and bless my life. But if you think, Ya Allah, that death is better for me, then allow for me a good end and bless me in my death. Only under those circumstances can you ask for death. The other situation in which you can ask for a type of death would be to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala death in Medina. So he told me what? I'm afraid. If I would go out of Medina, I would die not in Medina. And that kind of blew my mind. From Mish'al, the Meccan driver talking about Makkah, to Sharif, the Puntian gentleman who talked about Medina, to Abdul Rahman al Ruhaili who also talked about Medina as well. And here I am beginning to try and reflect like, Makkah and Medina mean so much to these people. And I was thinking about the million people who were in Makkah and Medina and the people that I interacted with and so on and so forth. And I believe that everybody goes to Umrah, everybody goes to Makkah and Medina with different sets of intentions. And unfortunately, there are people who treat Makkah and Medina like a holiday. There are. But there are also great people with great intentions going to Makkah and Medina. I was there and it was raining, as I said. Four nights straight raining in Makkah. And when it rained, the majority of the people would look for shelter. But there were a lot of people who stood in the rain, 
continuing to make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala much more devoted and much more committed there were a lot of people while it rained heavily continued to make their tawaf crying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala they were in bliss they were in the rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I was thinking to myself what are they feeling in their hearts there were people in Makkah and Medina and they walked different gentlemen walking slowly and respectfully <coughs> and you hear about this a lot in the old narrations right whenever that the generation of the old would walk into Medina there's a change of demeanor and when they would be asked why is it that you walk differently in Medina they said don't you realize that this is the very land that our beloved prophet was buried in I was in one of the museums and there's a lot of museums these days in Makkah and Medina and it was in the museum for the expansion of the mosque of the Prophet the history of the mosque of the Prophet from the time of the Prophet ﷺ to the present day and it was going to like from the time of the Prophet to the expansion of Uthman to the time of the Umayyads and the Ottomans and so on and so forth and at the end of it there was this huge model right and then the person the guide gave a beautiful conclusion he then said and gentlemen ladies remember one thing that today what you see of Medina, however beautiful and vast and, and wide it is, remember one thing. This exact space that we see is exactly the Medina during the time of the Prophet. No more than that. That's it. Which means what? Every step that you take in the mosque of the Prophet could have been the house of a companion. Every step that you took could be a place that the Prophet ﷺ stood. The very place that you are walking on could be a place in which the Prophet sallallahu read the Quran. So when you walk in Medina, when you walk in the mosque of the Prophet sallallahu walk respectfully and walk with dignity. You look around and you see people carrying themselves differently because they realize the worth of that place. The last person that I saw, and this was the one that made me shiver and cry. And throughout the whole journey, I'm not sure why, but I was very nervous this time around. Maybe, you know what, a long time I've not gone for Umrah, I was very nervous. I kept crying here and there. But the last very moment that kept me really crying was a particular moment, and I think it was between Maghrib and Isha. So there are classes, right? An Arab Shay or Pakistani Shay in Medina. And there's also a particular seat, a particular class for Malays. It's an Indonesian Sheikh. And I went on and looked around and then there was a particular small gathering in which students or congregants could go up to a sheikh who was readily waiting for people to listen to your recitation of the Quran. Either your memorization or the way of your tajweed and, and so on and so forth. And a lot of people queued up. And they would read. And you hear some locals reading, oh this guy is reading beautifully. And the sheikh would commend the person and give some form of certification. Here you go, barakallahu fikum. But at the end of that particular line, were two people. There was a young person, I think around 15, 16 years old, accompanied by the other. The 15, 16 years old was a gentleman with Down syndrome. And he was waiting in line to read the Quran to Sheikh. And he was waiting and he was kind of like a bit kind of nervous and stuff. And then when he came to his turn, he read. And he read no, not the most perfect recitation, of course, as you would expect. But the Sheikh continued to like hold his head and be compassionate towards him and so on and so forth. And when he was done, he cried. He said, Alhamdulillah, I, I'm in the mosque of the Prophet, I'm reading the Quran to the Sheikh. His brother hugged him. The Sheikh hugged him and he went back. I'm thinking to myself, I'm here in Makan Medina. A million people are here in Makan Medina, but people feel differently. So when people will go up to me and ask me like, Ustaz, how was your trip? I'm not sure. You know what, my body is here, but surely my heart is still in Makkah Medina. We ask Allah that Allah allows us to visit Makkah Medina again, inshallah. Amin. Wallahu ta'ala ala wa alam. I didn't mean to be emotional. Minta maaf lah banyak-banyak for the awkwardness in the morning. But Wallahu ta'ala ala wa alam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept all of our worship, inshallah. For those who have gone to Makkah and Medina, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow for them to revisit again. For those who have never been to Makkah and Medina, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala facilitate your matter, inshallah. Wallahu ta'ala a'ala wa alam, ladies and gentlemen, and now we begin after half an hour. That was a lengthy introduction. Minta maaf lah banyak-banyak. So, ladies and gentlemen, we are doing a class 
a lesson pertaining to ulul azmi and there are a number of things that we are going to be looking at but today insha'Allah some form of a prefatory discussion let's begin here insha'Allah now pertaining to the ulul azmi and we're going to do it slowly insha'Allah concerning why are they called the ulul azmi like who are they uh, what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instruct of us vis-a-vis -vis the ulul azmi and so on and so forth but let's look at this particular verse first and this is an instruction from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to emulate the ulul azmi now number one would be that if there is such an instruction in the Quran generally our scholars say that the ruling of it is obligatory so the instruction here is says Allah says in the Quran a'udhu billahi min shaitan rajim fasbir kama sabar ulul azmi min rusul Allah says in the Quran, therefore, bear patiently as did the messengers endowed with great determination, bear up with patience, and do not seek to hasten for them. On the day that they shall see that they are promised, they shall be as if they had not tarried save an hour of the day. A sufficient exposition shall then any be destroyed save the transgressing people. So this is in Surah Al-Ahqaf, verse 35. Now, a number of important things for me to begin with. Now, when we live, from a sociological and psychological perspective, it is impossible for human beings to live without some form of emulation. We need a type of a model to follow. That's always it. We live in replication of others. And it is really dependent upon who we replicate, who we choose as models. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he talks about prophets in the Quran, when he talks about ulul azmi in the Quran and so on and so forth, that's exactly the point. So that you have some form of a reference, some form of a model that you can actually follow. And pertaining to those who you follow, pertaining to men who live on earth, our scholars talk about this particular issue called the theory of afdaliyah. The theory of afdaliyah, and I think that I have once talked about this particular issue before. Allah has created things and things are not in a uniform or in a same category. There is always something greater and lesser than something. Things are not the same. But this is something that the modern people would want to try and assert. It's the same. And because things are the same, because people are the same, because place is the same, because action is the same, there does not need to be any form of amendment to character. I've talked about this pertaining to parents. In Islam, we understand that a parent is not like a child. The stature of a parent is different. And because of understanding that particular stature and value, there is a requirement for you to carry yourself accordingly and proportionally to the value by which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has bestowed them with. But in the modern world, particularly in the Western world, they don't understand that, right? Parents are just biological. A child at the age of 18 is expected to leave the house. They go and work and go to school, they return back home and now they don't call their fathers or their mothers the way that they used to before. Now they would refer to their parents by their name. Hi Dave, tiba-tiba. Try and do that in our community, right? Dulu panggil ibu dan ayah, suddenly you call them by a name. Hi Hassan, oh we pingsan we. Now, we believe in afdaliyah, superiority and inferiority. When Allah created place, space, not all space is the same. Allah has will for that the mosques of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are greater than any other space on earth, correct? Baitun min buyutilla is the houses of the houses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you enter into the mosque of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you make a dua. Allahumma ftahli abwa barahmatik. Ya Allah, open for me the doors of your mercy. You enter into a mosque and you know that your ibadah is multiplied in regards to its reward. You have i'atikaf. When you leave the mosque, you make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allahumma inni as'aluka min fadlik. Ya Allah, I ask of you whatever access in good that you would want to prepare for me, Ya Allah. It's not the same. Allah created space and we know for a fact that there are three places that are considered to be greater than anyone else in the world. You have Al-Aqsa, you have Masjidun Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa and Medina, and then you have Makkah. It's not the same. When Allah created time, time is also not the same. The middle of the night for worship is better than the middle of the day. And we know that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created in a year four sacred months. 
Allah created in a particular year a month which is considered to be greater than all other months which we know as Ramadan. And not all of the days and nights of Ramadan are the same. The last parts of Ramadan are greater than the first parts of Ramadan. And then there's one night that's greater than all other nights, right? Laylatul Qadri Khairun bin al Shahr. Time is all not the same. And when Allah created men, men are also not the same. There are people whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refer to as Anbiya, Prophets, Rusul, Messengers. There are the Siddiqin, the Shuhada, the Salihin, the Awliya, they are not the same. Now, Ulul Azmi would be a type of people that are posited high up that particular rank. So when we discuss them, we are not discussing some form of a historical figure. No, you're talking about a group of people that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have merited and gave superiority and made them exemplary figures for us to follow. Hence, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala obligated fasbir and be patient like them. Obligation. Now, in order for us to understand this particular verse well, and this is per our common methodology, right? We need to understand the context. Now, this is in Surah Al-Ahqaf. And verse 35 is, in fact, the last verse of Surah Al-Ahqaf. So, it is a conclusion to the Surah. So, what does the Surah speak of? This is important, that Allah concludes in that particular way. Now, here, a number of things. Now, Surah Al-Ahqaf was revealed after Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wa alihi wa sallam returned from Ta'if to Makkah. And according to the authentic traditions, it was three years before Hijrah. So from the perspective of time, it's a Meccan Surah. To be more specific, it was revealed to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wa alihi wa sallam when he returned from Ta'if. Now, we know about Ta'if, right? I was in Ta'if and alhamdulillah, we were able to access some places that I've never accessed before. The exact garden of Addas. Remember that story pertaining to Addas? When the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wa went to Ta'if, hoping that people would embrace him, hoping that people would want to listen to him, because his own community rejected him, he went to Ta'if for a couple of nights. Instead, he faced much greater persecution, much greater ridicule. Well, in fact, Aisha radiallahu anha wa ardaha narrated that the Prophet told me, said Aisha, that there was no more humiliating situation that the Prophet faced than Ta'if. He was beaten up. When the Prophet left Ta'if, he sat at a particular garden. Alhamdulillah, I was able to go to that garden, access that very garden. Alhamdulillah. Right? And he met a particular gentleman by the name of Addas. Addas in Ninawi. The slave was not, was not Meccan, was not Ta'if. He came from the outside, he was enslaved. Right? And when he saw the Prophet beaten up and bloodied, he went to the Prophet and offered drink. Now, as the Prophet was about to drink from that particular glass of water, he said, Bismillah, as he would. And Addas remarked to the Prophet saying, These are words that are not common amongst men here. People didn't say those words, Bismillah, Bismillah Rahman Rahim. And he asked, like, who are you? And the Prophet said that I'm Muhammad from Makkah, a messenger of God. And the Prophet asked him, and what is your name and where are you from? And even at that, Addas was rather surprised and taken aback. Because as a slave, you do not communicate and socialize with. They are treated as if they don't exist. You're not supposed to be sitting with them. But here, a prophet of God sat with a slave and communicate to him with great amount of honor and respect. The Prophet asked him, and what is your name? And he says, my name is Addas. And I come from a place called Ninawa. Ninawa is still on the map today, by the way, in Iraq, old Iraq. And the Prophet replied by saying, ah, min qaryati rajulin salihin yunus ibn matta. Oh, from that village, that once a righteous person lived by the name of Yunus ibn Matta, referring to Prophet Yunus. Right? We know of Nabiullah Yunus alayhi salam teaching us those beautiful words, La ilaha illa anta subhanaka inni kuntu minal When he heard that, he was 
How does an Arab person know about all of this historical information? And how is it that a free man can speak to me this way, respecting me, offering me my rights, and so on and so forth? After a bit, he became Muslim. That was the story. The Prophet came back still broken. After 10 years of doing da'wah in Makkah, his friends getting killed, atrocities happening in Makkah, they were boycotted. He lost his blessed wife Khadija radiallahu anha wa ardaha. He lost his uncle Abu Talib. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down this particular verse telling the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallama, Fasbir kama sabara ulul azmi minar rusul. O Muhammad, this is what I instruct of you. Be patient like the patience of the ulul azmi before you. Now what is interesting to note would be this. Was not the Prophet patient already? He was already a patient person. Now we know the extension of that particular story. As the Prophet ﷺ left Ta'if, an angel came down to the Prophet ﷺ and said, Ya Muhammad, if you would please, if you would want, I would now destroy these mountains and collapse it onto the people of Ta'if. We would do that for you immediately if you would want to. What did the Prophet say? There are two narrations, right? In one narration, the Prophet sallallahu said, Allahumma hdi qawmi fa innahum la ya'lamun. No, don't do that. And then he made a dua. Ya Allah, guide my people. And that's an interesting word, right? The exact people who beat up the Prophet, threw filth at the Prophet, Heard vulgarities at the Prophet sallallahu How did the Prophet refer to them? Ya Allah, guide my people. He was not quick to excommunicate. He was not quick to insult. But rather he said, Ya Allah, guide my people. For they simply do not know. The Prophet even gave an excuse for them. The only reason that they treated me this way is because they have not understood well. Maybe you know what? They'll understand better later on and they'll treat me differently. In another narration, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wa made a dua: "Asallahu ayya khurja min aslabihim, malam yushriku bihi shay'a." Ya Allah, I hope that from this particular community, there will be a group of people who will truly worship you and believe in you will not commit shirk. It is proven today that in Saudi Arabia, a lot of important great scholars came from Taif. The people, the exact people who treated the Prophet sallallahu that way, but by the blessing of the Prophet sallallahu dua, became the greatest of people. In that particular situation, that the Prophet was already patient, he never retaliated, he never heard, forgot, he never swear at people. Allah still told the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wa "Oh Muhammad, you want to know one thing? The standard of patience is with whom?" Even to Prophet Muhammad But well, what is interesting is this That at that particular point There were four Ulul Azmi Nuh, Ibrahim, Musa and Isa After that particular moment How many Ulul Azmi are there? Five Who was included in that particular list? The Prophet Right? Now number two I'm actually a bit worried about time We are at Slide 3 of 16. <laughs> Pacing has always been a problem for me. Tapa, we'll do what we can. Now, the surah speaks about the difficulty of da'wah which the prophets went through. So, if you look from the very beginning of Surah Al Ahqaf until the very end, it speaks about Nabiullah Hud, salam, Nabiullah Musa, salam, and the rest of the communities as well, and how difficult da'wah was. Number three, the surah also speaks about the development of men, and then there's the mention of the role of parents. Allah talks about the importance of parents. Now, our scholars try to figure out the correlation. And this is something that we do a lot in our classes, right? Whenever that we look at a particular set of verses, we always ask the question, like, what's the correlation between this set of verses and the set of verses before? What's the correlation between this surah and the surah after? That's always important to note. As we have said many, many times before, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is very deliberate in His words. And there's nothing redundant. There's nothing disconnected. Everything connects well. So what's the correlation between talking about patients, talking about prophets, and then talking about parents? Right? It is to say that the development of the human being and the ability for you to persevere and to be patient 
in the face of difficulty and tribulations in life is none other than an early development that you need to build. And the first stage that is important in the development of your fortitude, in the development of your character, is greatly dependent upon whom? Your parents. There's an interesting hadith of the Prophet wasalam, in regards to his explanation. The hadith we have talked about before many times. The Prophet wasalam, said, Kullu bani Adam yuladu ala al-fitrah. فَأَبَوَاهُ يُهَوِّدَانِهِ أَوْ يُمَجِّسَانِهِ أَوْ يُنَصِّرَانِهِ Until the end of the hadith. أو كما قال النبي. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam said, Every child of Adam is born in the situation of fitrah. And there are many theological implications to that. Some scholars say that fitrah here means Islam. So by default, every baby is Muslim. And that is why from a theological perspective, if a child dies before puberty, right, automatically enters heaven, correct? So that's that particular understanding. Now some scholars say that fitrah here does not necessarily mean Islam, but rather a state of emptiness, a state of a clean slate. And then the Prophet said, and the parents are the ones who makes the children either Jews or Christians, or Magians. Now what does it mean? What is the Prophet wasalam, trying to arrive at? I recently read a particular academic journal article about this particular issue and he was in the beginning talking about the relationship of Muslims with Allah. The author, the scholar says that every Muslim have a different relationship with Allah. Your basic relationship with Allah is a relationship of slave and master. That's something that we all have. But upon that, or after that, we all differ. Certain people have a relationship of legality with God. Meaning, everything is legal. Why do you pray to Allah? Because Allah says it's wajib. It's legal. Some people, their relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a relationship of fear. Why do you worship Allah? Why do you pray? Why do you do this and that? Because I feel if I don't pray, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to punish me. Some people have the, an opposite type of a relationship which is none other than love. Why do you worship Allah? Well, because I love Allah. Now, the scholar then says, and this is something that everybody needs to unpack. You need to figure out, how do you view Allah? And it's an interesting hadith, right? In which the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wa sallam said that Allah subhanahu wa said, "Ana inda zanni abdi bi." In a hadith that is kulsi, Allah says, "I am as my servant views me." So if you view Allah subhanahu wa taala as a scary god, Allah is going to treat you that way. If you view Allah subhanahu wa taala being legalistic. Allah is going to treat you that way. But if you view Allah subhanahu as a compassionate, loving God, that's how Allah subhanahu is going to treat you as well. Now the author then extends the discussion. He says, but how do you develop that kind of an ability? How do you develop a type of a relationship with Allah subhanahu that is healthy and sound? He says, he argues, then when you look at the Quran, this emotional capacity is usually mentioned through the relationship between people and parents. There are many parts of the Quran in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would mention worshipping Allah, obeying Allah, and then immediately after that Allah says, and obey your parents. And there's no other human being ever besides Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam that Allah would share a verse with. None. So you have La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah. One verse which Allah shares with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi wa Wasallam. Besides that, nobody else except for whom? Parents. Parents. So the author who is a psychologist, he says, if you have a relationship with your parents that is sound, right? This is also similar, right? When you look at your parents, we treat our parents differently. There was also a study a couple of years ago psychological study pertaining to how children perceive their, their parents. In psychology, this is called attachment theory. In the class, there are students. Huh? It's called attachment theory. There are four models of attachment to parents. Right? At times, it's an endearing type of relationship. Sometimes, it's a disciplinarian type of relationship. Right? These types of relationships, 
is going to affect the child long term. The author then suggests, if you have a endearing, compassionate kind of a relationship with your parents, that would also facilitate your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So parents will be the first point of your development of your emotional self. And that is why in this particular surah, Allah subhanahu wa talks about da'wah, Allah talks about patience, Allah talks about perseverance, and then suddenly Allah talks about parents. Why? Because it is at that particular stage that you begin to develop that kind of emotion. And if you can treat your parents well, and if you have a compassionate and loving relationship with your parents, having a good relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala becomes easy. So that's the correlation thus far. Wallahu ta'ala a'la wa'alam. Now, number four. The surah mentions also, suddenly, concerning jinns embracing Islam. Again, what's the correlation? The correlation here, as Al-Imam Razi rahmatullah alayhi would mention, is talking about the difficulty of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi doing da'wah. Why is it that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the Prophet, be patient like the ulul azmi? Allah would not ask of the Prophet high amounts of patience except for the responsibility is weighty. The greater problem that you face, the more patience that you need, correct? Now for the Prophet ﷺ, if you think about the burden of the Prophet, it is the burden unlike any other burden put on any human being on earth. None. Not only that he has the responsibility of talking to the Arabs, a backward people of that particular time, an uncivilized nation, the Prophet ﷺ is also carrying the burden of being the final messenger, carrying the final message, a witness to mankind. He also has a responsibility in the hereafter as a witness for in the entirety of mankind. On top of that, the Prophet also has a responsibility upon jinn. Hence, Allah subhanahu wa tells the Prophet sallallahu wa O Muhammad, we know your burden. We understand how much that you have to carry. And for that, you will need to look for a model for you to follow. Be patient, O Muhammad, like the people before you amongst the ulul azmi. So this verse, فَصْبِرْ كَمَا صَبَرَ أُولُلْ عَزْمِ مِنَ الرُّسُلْ can only be truly understood if you understand the context of this surah, which is Surah Al-Ahqaf. Right? Wallahu ta'ala a'ala wa'alam. Oh, timing teruk lah. Tak apalah. I don't want to rush anything. If we can finish this, we shall. If not, you know what? We'll bring it next week, inshallah. Now, number one will then be, we begin the discussion. Kelaka, we begin the discussion. Bismillah. Why are they called ulul azmi? That's the first most important question. Now, here, the tulis Arab. I'm so sorry, I didn't get to translate this. This is in the tafsir of Imam Siyuti Rahmatullah Ali. In which he quotes, Wa akhraja ibn Abi Hatim wa ibn Marduya an ibn Abbasin radiyallahu anhuma qala ulul azmi min al-rusuli an Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa Nuh wa Ibrahim wa Musa wa Isa. So there are five amongst the ulul azmi according to Imam Siyuti Rahmatullah Ali narrating ibn Abbas. And then he says, Wal azm ulul azmi, right? The word ulu in the Arabic language refers to the one who possesses. Ulu means the one who possesses. There's another word for it, which is the word zu. The difference are not that much. But some scholars say that the word ulu means an ownership that is encompassing. If you own something entirely, they use the word ulu. If you have some form of ownership over something that is slight, it is called zu. For example, you have a particular figure in the Quran by the name of Zul Qarnain. For example, right? Zul. The one who possesses the two horns. If I am to translate it that way. We are doing currently a study of Surah Al-Kahfi in one of our classes and we went on a, a lot pertaining to that particular name. Zul Qarnain would be, or the story of Zul Qarnain in Ya'juj and Ma'juj would be one of the four stories mentioned in Surah Al-Kahfi, right? But the question has always been like, who is Zul Qarnain? Surah Al-Kafi is, is, has always been a very cryptic surah. And Allah intended it to be that way. That the deciphering of that particular surah unlocks a lot of important lessons for the current age. But who is Zul Qarnain? From a Quranic and Sunnah perspective, it is not mentioned at all. We don't know who he is. We know him to be an important leader, a great commander of war, and that's it. 
But from a historical perspective, there are attempts to try and figure it out. Some would say that he was Alexander the Great of Macedonia. Alexander, right? Today in Egypt, we have Alexandria, right? That Alexander the Great. And some say that, no, he's actually Sarius the Great. Some say Darius the Great of Persia. But Allah Ta'ala A'la wa'alam. But for those who say that he was Sarius the Great of Persia, they say that because the name of Zulqarnain is indicative of that. What does the word Zul mean? The one who possesses it, right? The word Qarn in the Arabic language could mean two things. The first meaning of Qarn means horn. Horn. So he is one who possesses two horns. Like, what does it mean? So they say that he is a type of a commander for a leader in which when he goes to battle, he wears a particular helmet that has two horns. My childish, my childish self will automatically go to Loki. Takpelah. Right. For those who are not used to my classes, my references are off and odd. But you know what? They say that Alexander the Great does not wear a helmet with two horns, but Sardis the Great from Persia did. So they say it must be Sardis the Great. Wallahu Allah, we don't know. But there's another meaning to horn as well. Horn also means the end of a place. They say the word the horn of Africa, correct? They also say, for example, the horn of Sumatra, which is what? Aceh. The end of Sumatra. So if his name is Zulkarnain, it could have mean he's the person who owns the ends of the world. One who has rule over the east and the west. That could also be the meaning of Zulkarnain. Wallahu a'lam. The other possible meaning of Zulkarnain is the word Qarn to not mean horn, but the word Qarn to mean time. Because in the Malay language, right, we have the word Kurun, which means an age. So he's a person who possesses two time. What does it mean? He said that he once lived and had some form of involvement with Yajuj and Majuj, building that particular wall. And his army later at the end of time will fight Yajuj and Majuj and the army of Dajjal at the end of time. So his and his army will emerge in two times. Wallahu ta'ala a'la wa'alam. I'm actually just supposed to explain the word zoo. Tak tahu kenapa jauh sangat, tapi tak apalah. Now, the word zoo means somebody who possesses something, but not to the degree of ulu. Ulu means somebody who has full ownership of something. Now, as for the word azam, which we also have in the Malay language as well, azam. Tomorrow, people are going to have azam tahun baru, which means intention, which means aspiration, and so on and so forth, right? Now, in the Arabic language, the word azam could mean a number of things. The first one is here. Al-iradatu salbatul qawiyah. A positive, strong intention. Or will. A positive, strong will. That's the meaning of al-azam. One. Number two here, it then says, wa yaqulu al-raghib. And al-raghib here is al-raghibul asfahani, the great ethicist of Asfahan. In his book, he says, Al-Azmu huwa aqdul qalbi ala imda'il amad. It is the heart being tied to a particular task. When you are determined to accomplish a task and nothing ever would stop you, that is called azam. So when Allah calls these great five prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ulul azmi, it is talking about men who have this strong will and determination People who would do everything that it takes to accomplish a particular task by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's the meaning of ulul azmi. Next. How many were there? Now, originally we said five. But just as a matter of academic exercise, the scholars are not in agreement to this. Right. In our classes, this is usually what we do, right? We always like discuss, there are different opinions here and there to kind of broaden our horizon. Now, there are three opinions. In the commentary to the, the Tahawiyah by a Sheikh uh, Saleh al Sheikh, he says, there are three opinions. The first opinion, he says that all prophets were Ulul Azmi. He said that Ulul Azmi is not a class of people, but rather a description of all of the prophets. So this is the first opinion. So all of them were Ulul Azmi, first opinion. Now the second opinion would be, there are 18 prophets who were Ulul Azmi. And these are the prophets that Allah subhanahu wa mentioned in Surah Al-An'am. And Surah Al-An'am, in my estimation, would be the surah that has the greatest concentration of stories of prophets. 
In other parts of the Quran, right, you have like Surah Yusuf and so on and so forth. You have one long story, very detailed, but it's one story. But in Surah Al-An'am, it's the highest concentration of the mention of prophets. So according to some scholars, the 18 prophets mentioned in Surah Al-An'am, they were all Ulul Azmi. But the strongest opinion concerning how many Ulul Azmi were there is the third opinion, which is none other than five. So that you know, whenever the people would say, you know what, Ulul Azmi are five, and you suddenly you interject by saying, but scholars differ, Woh Kencang say. There are three opinions, lah, macam tu lah. right? Now, this is how they would justify it. In this particular verse in Surah Shura, Allah identified these five. And in the tafsir of a lot of the companions, including Abdullah ibn Abbas, he says that when Allah talks about this particular verse in Surah Shura, Allah is in fact listing the five prophets of Ulul Azmi. Right? So this is the verse. Wallahu ta'ala a'la wa'alam So we are done with the prefatory portion And now ladies and gentlemen On our part On our part We are now instructed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala To follow them Right Now we are going to do Nabiullah Nuh alayhi salam first I'm not sure whether I should extend Let's do a bit inshallah Right Now let's do Nabiullah Nuh alayhi salam First of the five Now I wanted to actually do a timeline from Nabiullah Adam alayhi salam up to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam and look at like the historical and durational gap between one prophet to the other but I didn't get time to do a, a, a nice illustration I did a couple and then I realized that it looked ugly so I abandoned that particular task but what you will realize will be that they are rather proportionately spaced out proportionately spaced out I would send them and it's as if that they were pivotal points I will send prophet, 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 and at a pivotal point. And you see some form of decline in human behavior and human religiosity and belief. And then another Ulul Azmi would arrive. Until Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Wa but the question would then be, why these five prophets? That's an important question. Why Nuh? Why Ibrahim? Why Musa, Isa, and so on and so forth? Yes, we talk about determination, we talk about patience. But exactly in what regard? There are no more things, but primarily two. There were two things in which they actually displayed great amount of patience and perseverance and determination. Number one, obviously, is da'wah. They did da'wah in a way that nobody did. When you look at Nabiullah Nuh alayhi salam, clearly we know that he did da'wah for 950 years. Incomparable. Number two, is how they dealt with their families. Which is interesting. Nabi Nuh alayhi salam had a huge betrayal coming from his wife and son. Nabi Ibrahim alayhi salam faced injustice and betrayal directly from his father. Nabi Musa alayhi salam faced injustice and betrayal from his adoptive father and father, not mother, father. Fir'aun. It gets better throughout the end later on, right? But Nabila Isa Ali had a huge problem with the community, extended family. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi faced a lot of enmity from uncles. So two things, da'wah and then family. Now pertaining to Nabila Nuh alayhi salam, I keep looking at time. Now let's look at this. I think I can I can do this, right? Inshallah. Let's do 15 minutes and then we're done. Can we do that? Now these are the struggles that we can highlight during the life of Nabi Allah Nuh alayhi salam. Now the first one is this particular verse. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Al-Ankabut, Indeed, we send Nuh to his people and he remained among them for a thousand, a thousand years less fifty. Then the flood overtook them while they persisted in wrongdoing. So Allah is highlighting the duration. Allah says what? A thousand but fifty or a thousand less fifty which is what? Nine hundred and fifty years. And this is a particular way of people counting in the past. Not in the past, even today, right? Certain people still do count that way. When I was in Egypt, when you would ask for time, they would still count that way. You say like, what's the time now? And they would ask by saying, 9 but 15. I'm like, benda? cakap je like 45. Why are you telling me to do maths? Suddenly a calculation in the middle of the road, right? They would do that. I'm not sure why. I think maybe because a thousand or a full number is easier to work with, maybe. I'm not sure. Tapi itulah lebih kurang. 
Now, it was narrated to Ibn Abbas said, Allah sent Nabi Nuh AS when he was 40 years old. And he remained among them for 1,000 years less 50, calling them to Allah. After the flood, he lived for another 60 years until the people increased in numbers and spread out. So, ni mathematical calculation. So, how long did Nabi Nuh live? 1,050. <laughs> he lived for 1,050 years. But this is again not agreed upon. Some scholars say that 950 years was his age. When Abbas radiallahu anhu said no, right? He became a prophet at the age of 40. Nobody, no prophet becomes a prophet as a baby, right? So in all, according to Abdullah bin Abbas, 1050. Now the issue here is the issue of time. A lot of people can say, so I struggled in doing this. I bore patience with this particular problem, Mr. And at times, you know what, you hear this particular statement that people say, when a person is broken or sad or grieving, he says that, you know what, only time will heal. It's a truthful statement, but it, it feels defeatist. It feels like a person is giving up at times. Nabi Nuh had to endure 950 years. Over and over and over again, facing the exact same problem. And the problem did not come from outside only, but also from within his household. So that's number one. Number two, the disbelieving chiefs of his people said, and this is in Surah Hud, we see you only as a human being like ourselves, and we see that no one follows you except the lowliest amongst us who follow you hastily without thinking. And we do not see anything that makes all of you any better than us. In fact, we think you are liars. Now, what is Nabi Allah Nuh AS facing here? Character assassination. Ad hominem. When you debate with people, right? The success of a debate is dependent upon the argument. It's dependent upon successful conversation, relaying points and facts. A coward, a person who is inferior in thought and intellect, at the point that they cannot argue well, what would they do immediately? Attack your personality. This is exactly what Nabi Allah Nuh faced for 950 years. Instead of listening to him and what he had to say, the people talked about him. But you're not rich. You're like the normal person. You're not from a high caste, not from a high class. And all of the people who follow you, weak people, poor people, and they blindly follow you over and over and over. His character was attacked over and over again. Second. Number three, what Nabi Allah Nuh AS also faced is this, and Allah says this in the Quran in Surah Nuh. Nabi Nuh said, My Lord, indeed I invited my people to the truth night and day. By my invitation, increase them not except in flight. Meaning, the more that I did da'wah, the more that they ran away. And indeed, every time I invited them to you, sorry, and indeed, every time I invited them that you may forgive them, they put their fingers in their ears, covered themselves with their garments, persisted, and were arrogant with great arrogance. Then I invited them publicly. Then I announced to them and also confided to them secretly and said, ask forgiveness for your Lord, of your Lord, indeed, he is ever a perpetual forgiver. What is Allah talking about here? The amount of work that he did, the different types of effort that he put in, the different strategies that he put in, but everything to failure. At times you have a particular problem, right? You try a particular way, it doesn't work. You try another way, it works. At times it's frustrating when you have to like figure things out. And at times, you hear this as well, right? Somebody, let's say like a family member. This is like a real thing that, that somebody told me. There was a family member who was not practicing Islam the best. So he felt the responsibility to advise his family member. He tried his very best. He spoke nicely. He advised with kind words and so on and so forth. But the guy didn't want to listen. And then somebody else outside of the family advised that particular person with the exact same manner and content. And the person listened. I'm like, what? I said the same thing. But that's how it works, right? But it doesn't matter as long as the person changes, as long as he is guided, Alhamdulillah. But again, the frustration is real. Nabi Nuh went on and on, day and night, 
public and secret this way try to invent incentivize and so on and so forth to no avail number three number four what did he do Noah called out to his Lord saying my Lord certainly my son is also of my family this particular verse is in the context of the exact moment when the flood happened and he was about to see his own son drowning he called to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a father Ya Allah my son is also my family and your promise is surely true and you are the most just of all judges and Allah replied oh no he is certainly not of your family he was entirely of unrighteous conduct until the end of it now not only his son we also know his wife ضرب الله مثلا للذين كفروا امرأة نوح وامرأة لوط كانتا تحت عبدين من عبادنا الصالحين فخانتهما فلم يغني عنهما من الله شيئا وقيل دخول النار مع الداخلين and we set forth a parable an example Allah says in the Quran in surah Tahrim the example of unfaithful treacherous women in the example of the wife of Nuh and Lut and ironically enough they were wives and spouses to greet men Nuh and Lut but they betrayed them most horrible of women this happened to Nabilah Nuh now however it was right however he was betrayed you need to understand one thing Nuh was still a human being Nuh was still a father Nuh was still a husband surely it hurt him so he called to Allah subhanahu wa Allah save my son Ya Allah Ya Allah, guide my son, Ya Allah. But Allah says what? Number four. Number five. And this is from a hadith of the Prophet. And I think that of all, this might be the worst. Now, narrated Abu Sa'id, and here Abu Sa'id is Abu Sa'id in Al-Khudri. Allah's Messenger said, Nuh and his nation will come on the day of resurrection, and Allah will ask Nuh, did you convey the message? Oh Nuh, did you do your job? And Nuh replied to Allah by saying, Yes, Ya Allah. And then Allah would ask the people of Nuh that he spent doing da'wah with for 950 years. Did Nuh convey the message to you? They would reply, Nope, no prophet came to us. What is the prophet trying to tell us? Nuh was a person who was totally unappreciated. And that is one of the worst feelings to have as a human being, right? especially when you put in work dedicate to help people out to care for a particular person and people ignore your efforts right? somebody came up to me and, and told me this it was like a husband and wife thing i'm not sure why but recently a lot of the queries that i receive pertains to husband and wife at times it gets a bit uncomfortable but you know being in ustaz i guess that's what you sign up for it wasn't in the list, I didn't, I didn't tick a box, but it came naturally. But he said, sir, I, I don't think that my wife appreciates me much. Maybe not at all. I'm like, oosh. Like, why? Doesn't she say, I love you? Like, my wife says, I love you, but I, I don't care much about that. I put in a lot of work, sir. They check out. This particular gentleman, right? And, and one of the things that I cannot do is housework. I don't know how to iron clothes. I don't know how to sweep the floor. I was brought up that way. And there are certain communities like that, right? But when I got married, I learned that, how to sweep. I learned that, how to fold clothes. I looked at YouTube videos of how to, close, to, to fold clothes. I fold clothes a lot at the entirety of the day. My wife came back to the laundry. She unpacked everything and fold the clothes according to her way. And she said, that's not nice. Feeling unappreciated is a horrible feeling. Right? At times, as a sibling, you take care of a parent. And you do all that you can. And nobody else does. But people ignore your contributions. Does it happen? It happens. Nabi Nuh felt unappreciated entirely. Allah goes to these people. Did Nuh convey the message to you? What did they say? Nope, not a bit. We didn't see any prophet. And here, Allah will ask Nuh alayhi salam, who will stand a fit witness for you? He will reply, Muhammad and his followers. Nuh will say whom? Prophet Muhammad. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam here, right? He said, so I and my follower will stand as witnesses for him. The Prophet Muhammad and us, we will in the hereafter tell Allah subhanahu wa ya Allah, Nuh did his job. 
Ya Allah, Nuh persevered for 950 years, Ya Allah, bless him, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, Nuh did all that he could and he was pained throughout, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, we bear witness to that. Now, scholars say from this particular hadith is also an important lesson that we can learn. That as a community of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, one of our characteristics is this, we stand up to injustice. One of the characteristics of the Ummah of Prophet Muhammad is that we do not tolerate injustice and atrocities and we speak up. Today, whatever ever is happening in Palestine, right? As the community of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, as we will do in the hereafter, we will do it today as well. Speak up. You see any injustice, whatever it is, political, whatever it is, or at home, community, speak up. And at the end of it, that is the interpretation of the statement of Allah. Thus, we have made you a just and the best nation that you might be witnesses over mankind. So, Nabiullah Nuh alayhi salam is called Ulul Azmi. He is amongst the Ulul Azmi because he persevered through 950 years with these five things. He persevered over an extended period of time. It is easy to struggle with something in a short period of time, but an extended period of time, difficult. He was character assassinated and hurt emotionally. He did tireless work, but there's still no results. No support entirely from family. Some historians will say that one of his children or two of his children accepted, but the majority of them did not. And lastly, he was unappreciated entirely. After all of this, he still remained upon La ilaha illallah. After all of this, he remained upon doing good to people. Upon this, he still remained the beautiful soul that he was. So the call to action here, ladies and gentlemen, would be, well, be patient like Nabi Allah. No. <laughs> A very tall order, but didn't Allah subhanahu say in the very beginning, Fasbir. Kama sabar ulul azmi min rusul and be patient like the ulul azmi were patient in the past. So alhamdulillah, ladies and gentlemen, I kind of sped through the last portion, but hopefully it made sense. We ask Allah subhanahu wa taala whatever that we learn is of benefit, insha Allah. Right? Next week onwards, we will insha Allah move on to the next prophet. If I think that there's nothing else that we should discuss concerning Nabi Allah, no, we shall move on insha Allah to Nabi Allah Ibrahim alayhi salam and look at important points of patience and perseverance. May Allah subhanahu wa allow us the ability to follow in your footsteps. May Allah subhanahu wa allow for us hearts that are strong and fortified. May Allah subhanahu wa provide us the ability to see and identify the wisdom and virtue of Allah despite the suffering that we see. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives us all insha'Allah. Amin ya rabbal alamin. I end and I open to questions if there is any. Are there questions here? Online, may Allah protect and guide us all from Subang Jaya, Malaysia. Hi Subang. Yes. Correct. To, to, to observe, to see with your own eyes. Mm -hmm. So how is it that we are in a different time and space, and yet we, are, we will stand uh, to witness that uh, Prophet Noah has already done his time? Barakallah Rafiq. Beautiful question. Uh, our madam asked the question, Ustaz, being a witness requires that you are present to see whatever unfolding and then to react accordingly. But the Prophet ﷺ told us that we shall be witnesses when in fact we were not present during the time of Nabi Allah Now concerning witnessing here, right, the word shahada, right? And even with that particular word, there are multiple kind of connotations to the word shahada. From a normal physical perspective, the word witnessing simply means to see. But another word shahada would also mean to understand. There are two words in the Arabic language to refer to shahada. One is a physical witnessing, to see something clearly with your eyes. And the other understanding of shahada means to understand. Al-idraq. So when you say, for example, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashadu anna muhammad rasulullah, I bear witness. Are you seeing anything? No. But you, what you mean by ashadu an la ilaha is that I deeply witness to the truth of the matter. I understand, I admit to the truth that there is no God but God worthy of worship and Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the message of God. So from a linguistic perspective, it is that. Shahada could also mean to understand. 
Now, from a spiritual perspective, right, then we look at this issue of do the dead, for example, those who have passed, do they have any type of access to the living? I'm particularly looking at Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wa first, right? Because the Prophet said, I shall bear witness, and so will my community. The Prophet has already passed away, but he says that I shall bear witness. Now, if you look at the linguistic argument, it means that Allah has informed the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wa alaihi wa Right? Throughout his entire life, the Quran was sent to the Prophet, and the Prophet understands. Now, even if the Prophet ﷺ has passed away, is there any form of access of the dead to the, to the living? Now, in some hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, right, it suggests that there is a possibility. For example, in the hadith of Salawat, what did the Prophet ﷺ say? The Prophet says that when a person does Salawat upon me, the angels relay that information to me and I respond. So there is still that type of a relaying, a sending of information, even if the Prophet ﷺ has passed away. And it is through the Prophet ﷺ and through the knowledge that you acquire from the Prophet and the Quran that we can bear witness to the Ummah of Nabiullah Nuh So that's the answer to that particular question. Barakallahu I hope that that answer suffices. There is a person online uh, typing in French. In a mini patrie et Betul I'm not making this up. I think that you are saying that you are in France. Bonjour. <laughs> Gentlemen, any questions? No? Ladies, any questions? Selalu banyak soalan. We are good on time. So this is also the first class. Tak apa kita warm up dulu. We shall suffice for today, inshallah. Tomorrow, inshallah, uh, is going to be uh, a new year. A new day for the new year. I'll see you guys next year. Itu uh, too, too lame eh, joke tu eh. Shouldn't have said that lah. I, I take that back. Kita doa kepada Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that whatever that we have done in the past year, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept. And whatever in the future, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide and bless. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us for the things that we are aware of and the things that we are not aware of. Rabbana fillana zulubana wa israfana fi amrina wa sabbit aqdamana wa ansurna ala al-qawmil kafirin. Rabbana fillana wa li ikhwanina lazina sabakuna bil iman. Wa la taj'al fi kulubina ghilla li lazina amanu rabbana inna kara'ufir rahim. Rabbana hablana min azwajina wa zurriyatina qurrata ayun maj'alna lil muttaqina imama. Allahumma faqihna fi ad-din wa allimna at-ta'wil wa ahdina ila sawa'i s-sabil ya arhamar rahimin. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fil آخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار وصلى الله على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم وبارك والحمد لله رب العالمين. Thank you so so much everybody. Hope to see everybody next week إن شاء الله. السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. By the way, our Sir Abdullah has actually prepared food the kabawa. Please before you leave, please collect. Ada ada kuih I think right? Ada roti. Ada roti kabawa. Please do get some food. Thank you everybody. See you guys next week.